good afternoon or good evening, and welcome to another HRO Today educational podcast. I'm Elliot Clark, the CEO of HRO Today. We publish HRO Today magazine, HRO Today EMEA, and HRO Today APAC. We're also the hosts of the HRO Today forum and educational events held around the world and the managers of the HRO Today Association. Today, we're going to talk about flexibility and market conditions and how they impact the talent economy. I'm thrilled to have as our guest, Ryan Carfley, who's the president and CEO of Personify. And Personify is one of the most highly rated recruitment process, outsourcing, and workforce service providers in the world, doing very well on our HR Today Baker's Dozen in both general sector areas and also on our HR Today Healthcare RPO list of top ranked companies. Over the past 20 years, Ryan has led the transformation of Personify from a locally owned boutique executive search firm to an award-winning global provider of RPO solutions. Personify has been on the Inc. 500 list as one of the fastest growing privately held companies in America. As I mentioned, they've made the Baker's Dozen list. He has won numerous awards as one of the top executives in Research Triangle Park. Ryan, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Elliot. Really, really an honor to be here and super, super grateful for all the time and consideration that your team puts in and putting together the Baker's Dozen list. We were elated to see where we fell this year. That's great. Why don't you just spend a moment and tell our audience a little bit about Personify, and then I want to get into our topic. I am the president and CEO at Personify. We are a global provider of RPO solutions headquartered here in RTP. Our primary focus is in delivering on-demand talent acquisition solutions across aerospace, healthcare, biotech, and life sciences primarily. And ultimately, the vast majority of our solution is designed to address challenges that our clients are facing around labor depletion, talent shortage, and strategic sourcing, as well as delivering an on-demand enterprise solution designed to allow you to scale in real time. So as you mentioned, this is my 21st year in the business, although it's hard to imagine it's been that long. And like we were just discussing, really no better time to be in our business, and it's an exciting time to be here at Personify, that's for sure. You know, I'm thrilled you joined the podcast. I was recently on your website, and your website made a few points I want to explore. You know, everywhere we read, we hear about talent shortage or what you just referred to as the labor-depleted marketplace. And I think everyone can agree there's a problem. I don't think anyone would argue that. But you go on to describe the problem in terms of hiring elasticity and the volatility of hiring going up and down, and that problem cannot be solved with a fixed infrastructure. And on personifysearch.com, you have this great graph showing the inefficiency of fixed infrastructures when you have a lot of hiring elasticity. Can you explain to the audience what you mean by the term hiring elasticity and why it is functionally and financially inefficient to have a fixed infrastructure? And bear in mind, we're going into an uncertain economic environment, right? now. So this is the time for us to have this conversation. Well, I think when you talk about hiring elasticity in its simplest form, it's the rapid rise or decline of requisition volume over the course of a year or a quarter, depending on how you're looking at it. And when you start to think about hiring elasticity, particularly as it relates to talent acquisition, over the course of the last 20 years that I've been in the business, the only constant that we've had, the only level of consistency that we've had is change. When you start to think about the birthplace, the very epicenter of workforce planning, it's generally, you see organizations trying to come up with a solution that are designed to address change and change that's generally driven by economic cyclicality, event-driven growth, any type of strategic business plan that may be changing. As you get into this time of year, Elliot, this is workforce planning season. We're right at the onset of that. And the one thing that we've seen is even the best laid business plans or workforce plans function a lot like a battle plan. As soon as we get into the throes of the year or as soon as shots are fired, that strategy needs to be able to change and needs to be able to to change quickly. And to put that into perspective, we had a client at the beginning of this year, this time last year, forecasted 400 hires in this calendar year. Well, as we sit here today, they've hired just over 2,000 people from us. So 5X what that hiring plan initially looked for. And if you put that into a practical plan of leveraging a fixed solution, like a strictly internal talent model, you're going to butt up against capacity issues. And those capacity issues are going to come in two forms. I'm either going to have a understaffed, under 
water cattle and acquisition team. And that team is going to not be able to clear their pipelines fast enough, do the strategic sourcing that's necessary to be effective. That has a direct effect on voice of customer, agency spend, outside third-party agency spending, and cycle time. And then the inverse of that, and certainly topical for what many of us think is potentially on the horizon, as requisition volumes start to change, you now have an abundance of talent acquisition people, which come with either high sunk costs and or some form of boredom, which is equally toxic. And so when we took a look at entering this market, we entered the RPO market in 2008, we knew there was an ample opportunity, we thought, to create some levels of disruption because the vast majority of our customers were trying to solve something that was highly variable with a fixed solution, which is why the basic premise for our talent acquisition platform is in our delivery model, which is on demand. There's all this uncertainty, and your points are well taken. I mean, probably the most obscene term in the HR lexicon is workforce planning, right? I think it's the bane of existence for most RPO firms and internal TA groups. Not because HR is is incompetent, but because hiring managers simply don't get it right. Mm -hmm. And to your point about the battle plan, it's really easy when the enemy cooperates, right? It's it's when the enemy does something unexpected that you wind up all with a problem. So as you look at all of these variables. It doesn't make sense that there's been this trend toward insourcing. You know, I know you're in the outsourcing industry, so we we know you're going to be more in that camp. But you've got all this uncertainty and all this variability. And then the best way to solve it is with a fixed infrastructure. It literally, if you say it in one sentence, it seems to not make a lot of sense. Yes, we have an extremely variable economic environment. Let's build something rigid to address that, okay? So let me pull this from the theoretical now to the practical, and let's discuss it. You know, for example, the last few years, we've seen rapid layoffs and furloughs, rapid return to work. We've seen talent shortages. Now we have looming economic warning signs. And since you clearly believe the fixed infrastructure of many HR groups prevents the ability to provide, and I'll put this in quotations, rapid adaptation opportunities that are provided by firms like Personify. You guys have scalability and design to go and quickly augment internal teams, generate the volumes necessary to both scale up and scale down. So you can actually scale up and scale down your own internal organization. You can add recruiters or reduce them. How do you manage this rapid adaptation approach? And can you give some examples of how it's efficient so that our audience can sort of weigh their options? Yeah, I think when you start thinking about rapid adaptation, like you mentioned, Elliot, there's no question that the sentence you just mentioned, hey, I'm applying a fixed solution to a highly variable problem. And that, by the way, that level of frustration that may be born from what you would call an internal TA team it can be driven. First of all, we're in the people business and people make decisions and people change their mind, which creates variability. Part and parcel with that is that you've got these economic conditions sometimes out of our control. If I'm in the life sciences business, I have very little control over something that may happen in a housing crisis like in 08. So you have the variable things that maybe we can improve on as a team that we can build into a workforce plan. And then you've got economic cyclicality, global pandemic that come in just when you think you've got that thing teed up to the right exact spot. They come in like a bowling ball and kind of knock all the pins down. So to answer your question about some of the differences in how we approach rapid adaptation to be able to provide solutions for our customers, the first thing I'll say is it comes in scale. Let's just talk about the basic premise of one organization, which is a team that's building this, let's say and the delta between that and an RPO. Well, an RPO has the advantage of scale. So we have multiple clients across both North America and Europe that are at different points in their hiring process. And because we have clients that are both adding and reducing headcount, we're able to quickly pivot our resources to keep up with those demands. So for starters, at its basis point, our scale is one that allows us to flex, whereas a fixed solution is static. The second thing is structure. So when you think about our delivery model, we're set up where we've got program managers that are constantly taking the pulse and the overall health of the business every quarter in our quarterly business reviews. And that enables us to set the course for the next quarter. And so it takes that annualized hiring plan and reduces it down to a 90-day window, which is probably far more realistic. We've got team leads that are constantly measuring the incremental steps in the hiring process, looking for inefficiencies and running those teams to the proper KPIs to make sure we stay on target. And then we've got recruiters that are doing our strategic sourcing that would give our customers the talent access they would get from a search firm. Additionally, we've totally segmented out all the back office function 
for pre-employment testing, interview scheduling, and coordination and expense reimbursement, all done by a SHRM certified team. So that our recruiters and our program managers and our team leads are never having to interface with any of the back office function that goes off. And then with all of that said, we have a full service recruitment marketing team that does all of our employment branding and EDP work on behalf of all of our customers in-house. Because we do all of that here, we can then effectively scale up and down in real time. And where this is really effective is in many of the customers that we serve in the middle market. Now, with all of that said, Elliot, our staff is a really big component of how we staff, which is part of what I think you're getting at here. So we've got to remain staffed at about 130% of capacity so that we have the ability to flex in real time. But the second component of that is how we attract talent here. We're constantly looking for people that are comfortable in ambiguity, highly flexible, work well under pressure, and are organized enough to work across multiple assignments concurrently. This helps tremendously when you start to think about the type of people that have to be able to function in a fast-paced, ever-changing environment. And then the last component to the way that we attack rapid adaptation comes in our analytics platform. It's based in a proprietary data warehouse. The metrics are driven primarily through our Oracle platform that is custom built. And the way that we measure our hiring process is by toll gate. And we measure the incremental differences between each step in the hiring process, which sounds really simple when you boil it down, Elliot. But when you stop and think about enterprise hiring and you think that you've got a constant bottleneck at toll gate three across 3,000 recs, you've got to pivot and make that adjustment in real time if you want to stay out in front of what is ultimately an avalanche that's mounting. So to sum it up, you certainly think that the way that we work through this comes in scale, structure, staff, and analytics, but ultimately, you've got to be measuring each incremental step of the hiring process, both at a macro and micro level, and then you've got to have the staff to be able to pivot in real time, and you've got to have an analytics tool that keeps up with both of those factors. Very interesting. And, you know, it, it is also interesting as you've built this to be, it sounds very modular in the approach, depending on what clients may or may not have put in the scope of your engagement with them. I don't understand, and maybe this sort of a little bit off topic, but why do clients look at outsourcing from the practitioner side as an all or nothing proposition? It sounds to me like if you're an organization that on a steady state should have X number of recruiters, and then you've got days where you need you know, 125% of X or 150% of X for seasons or years, there may be companies that want to use you to do everything. There may be companies that just want you to do augmentation or a whole panoply in between. But if you're that flexible, why don't they see the flexibility as an advantage to allow them to have flexibility that's essentially a phone call away? I think there's no question that as you describe where we live, we have end-to-end enterprise assignments, but we also are seeing a really rapid rise in exactly what you just described. As an organization, we take a look at our three-year run rate, and we know that we've got to be staffed to effectively address X number of annual requisitions or fills, and that's a combination of our current headcount our attrition rates, and any event-driven growth that we have for forecast. I think that the reason you see the rise in the blended solution is because those plans, like we've described, quickly become rewritten, and you've got to have a provider that is flexible enough to keep up with the ongoing demand in real time. The reason you don't see as much of it, one, I think it's taken some time for our group as providers to come around to the blended model, and then we've been servicing it from day one. And then I think the second component of that gets into the way that employers view cost. Is it truly more cost efficient to build this versus buy it? Certainly, there are appropriate arguments to be made, I think, on all sides of the equation, but the rubber really starts to meet the road when you stop and think about the cost of vacant mandates and the time it's going to take an organization, if they're going to build it internally, to attract, recruit, train, and deploy to value while the business is scaling in real time. And if we've all been in a steady state of either economic growth or it's just been a static environment, which we've never had since I've been in business over the 21 years, I think a standalone talent acquisition team can function. But I think in the absence of that level of consistency, you leave the door open for very poor voice to customer with the hiring managers and executive teams and an excessive cost per hire when you reach that threshold where cost no longer becomes a concern. We need to hire someone. We need to go out to third-party agency. So In the end, Elliot, I think we are seeing a rapid rise of blended models, and I think that's here to stay, candidly. 
I, I agree with you, and I think that it's also the smart play. We didn't have language around it when I was in the industry, but I would talk about the bellows effect. Sometimes you have to pump up the air volume, and sometimes you have to squeeze it down. But this idea that infrastructure has to either be fixed or outsourced is nonsensical. But it sounds like you've got a great model, and certainly you've made some very important arguments that rapid adaptation capability is really necessary in uncertain times. And the one thing that we can be certain of is that almost every year is full of uncertainty. That's at least the way it's been the last 10 years. I want to thank you, Ryan, for uh, taking part in the podcast and for explaining the, your thoughts on this. Thanks, Elliot. Really a pleasure to be here. And particularly a special thank you to everyone at the Baker's Dozen and the team that puts this incredible program together. Really grateful to be here. Our research team works hard on, on that. And Thank you. And, you know, you're welcome on behalf of that team. And we look forward to following the growth and success of Personify. And to our audience, think about how you're building your model. You know, this argument about what we need to be in source. If you're using external agencies on an individual fee for placement basis, I have news for you. You're still outsourcing part of your talent acquisition. So let's get away from the names and think about how you design an infrastructure that's flexible enough to deal with uncertainty, with rapid change, with variability, and make sure that you're doing it efficiently and effectively. One of the things that we never talk about in talent acquisition is the cost of unfilled jobs. And I assure you, it's very high. We thank you for your time and attention. We look forward to having you join our next HRO Today educational podcast. Thank you.